I'm awfully happy to be able to introduce my friend Derek Walcott and um, um, I've thought a little without too much coherence of just what I'd say and uh, I want to start with the rather now famous statement that uh, Robert Graves made about Mr. Walcott's first book in A Green Night and uh, Graves said, Derek Walcott handles English with a closer understanding of his inner magic than most, if not any, of his English-born contemporaries. Well, uh, Graves, nobody knows more, I suppose, about the inner magic of English than Graves, and uh, few people hand out fewer bouquets to other poets than Robert Graves. That, so that's a great distinction, and it's said with authority. And uh, um, I think the first thing to emphasize about Walcott is that he's a very good poet and um, he'd stand up against any other poet I think in England or America of his age and um, then um, one has to say what kind of poetry it is and um, it's a poetry of great resonance and color it's gone through several phases um, He's not like the typical British poet, I think, at all, that, uh, or even the typical American of our time. It's, it's, uh, it's a more powerful kind of poetry. It makes me think more of Hart Crane, that it has um, a great deal of that color and vehemence, though uh, it's not, I don't think, influenced by Crane. And... Um, um, I think a poet is lucky who was born in Trinidad, probably. If it doesn't bury him entirely, it, it's a blessing. And um, it's quite different than um, uh, being born in New York or perhaps anywhere in this country, that um, an island um, uh, half made up of Negroes, half of people from India, that's part of the British Empire, whose culture is British, it's much closer to England than we are. In this uh, Caribbean Sea that's largely Spanish. And um, when the Trinidad uh, writer looks back, um, he sees a past that's part of our past, but it's, um, um, it's, it's full of um, the Spanish conquests, galleons, Robinson Crusoe, people marooned. Um, sort of world Conrad writes about. And um, um, it has a lovely advantage of being both sort of more local than most things we have in America and more part of what most of the world is like. A Trinidad poet would be more like a South American poet and perhaps more like a French poet than an American could be. Um, Um, and I'm not making a comparison, but I think of Faulkner that um, um, it would have seemed maybe ten years ago that um, compared with Thomas Mann or even Gide, Faulkner was quite as talented a writer but a more provincial one, that he came from Mississippi and that limited him. And um, uh, now as time's unrolled, uh, Faulkner's subject, Mississippi, seems at the center of things, and his greater subject is uh, the Magic Mountain, say. These things are mysterious, they shift. And uh, Trinidad is both on center and off center. Um, Walcott's early poems um, I like very much for their sort of particularity and description, their wonderful scenes of Trinidad done into very good verse. And um, when I first met him several years ago, he was going into a new style, which I'll say distressed me at the time, that was much more abstract and uh, more like uh, René Char or Leger. And uh, I've now come to think that the later poems are much are a great advance and um, the poems he'll probably end with reading they have this they have wonderful particularity of locale and yet a daring almost surrealist use of imagery and they're haunting scenes that um, I can't get one theme for his poems but um, 
you think of someone on a beach um, um, various dry or objects about him and dried up animals looking at the blue sky uh, somehow facing the ultimate there's a, it's not the void of Valerie or Mallarmé but uh, somehow you're close to some absolute thing um, the sort of blankness of some eternity which comes out of the local setting and uh, um, I can't think of another poet in English who I haven't described the subject very well who has caught on to it the way Derek Walcott has and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce him and thank Mr. Lowell for his very kind, very generous introduction. I don't think there's any English poet anywhere who could have been paid a greater honor than to be introduced by Robert Lowell. And in fact, the equivalent is almost like having Yeats introduced at the guest, practically. That's how I feel. Um, all this week, I was very tempted to read the entire volume of Mr. Lowell's new poems for the Union Dead. And, uh, if there's anybody who would like to hear it after, you can stay for that. <laughs> um, I don't... Everything that I seem to do here, of course, is completely rehearsed. I've been practicing this all afternoon, so the casualness is entirely false. Um, for instance, I have here some very deliberately, you know, off... casual-sounding things, and it seems to me that they're going to fail, so I'd better put those aside. Um, I'd like to begin by reading the first poem in the volume that Farah Strauss have put out, Farah Strauss and Jeruf have put out. Um, this is a poem called A Far Cry from Africa. And um, I'd like to begin with it because to me it sort of crystallizes a problem that the West Indian faces, whether it's cultural or historical, and that is his experience a schizophrenic thing of whether where his um, exactly where his fidelities lie and there are moments of crisis either of personal experience or of historical experience in which we as West Indians have to make some sort of choice um, in a sense the choice can become artificial for instance I don't, I don't want to go on about this but the concept of negritude for us, in a way, I would say, is an alien one because um, we are brought up in an English tradition. We are brought up in a tradition in which the law is an abstract thing. It's maybe hard to explain, but for instance, a policeman in the West Indies is a Negro and not a white policeman. Um, in that sense, people of my generation are used to thinking of the law as something which functions quite distinctly from race. And in that way, I would say that the same thing applies to literature, that one doesn't think of oneself in the West Indies as a Negro or as an Indian writer particularly, but as a West Indian. In that way, I think that um, what Robert Lowell was saying earlier is something that makes one lucky to be born and to grow up in that area. Um, well, in this particular poem, I may talk about this a little later, if any other poem um, illustrates this. In this particular poem, the, the choice, the dilemma here, was the experience of the Mau Mau Rebellion, in which, as you know probably, there was an enormous amount of cruelty um, and reprisal in, this, in Kenya. Um, and I found myself, like a lot of students at that time, and this is a poem that came out of argument, discussion between students about um, you know, who was right at whatever cost, stuff like that. And I suppose like most, most poets, I am incapable of seeing um, the justification of any form of cruelty, however, particularly if it's immediate. You can't see 
the necessity of anything and to accept um, what is criminal or cruel as historical necessity is something that is very difficult for a poet to do. In that way, they are useless, I suppose, to any ideology or society. However, this is um, probably much better than the poem, what I've just said. <coughs> a Far Cry from Africa. And the, the title of the poem is ambiguous. It's supposed to mean a cry of torture and also a cry of distance. A wind is ruffling the tawny pelt of Africa. Kikuyu, quick as flies, batten upon the bloodstreams of the veldt. Corpses are scattered through a paradise. Only the worm, colonel of carrion, cries, waste no compassion on these separate dead. Statistics justify and scholars seize the salience of colonial policy. What is that to the white child hacked in bed, to savages expendable as Jews? Threshed out by beaters, the long rushes break in a white dust of ibises whose cries have wheeled since civilizations dawn from the parched river or beast teeming plain. The violence of beast on beast is read as natural law, but upright man seeks his divinity by inflicting pain. Delirious as these worried beasts, his wars dance to the tightened carcass of a drum, while he calls courage still that native dread of the white peace contracted by the dead. Again, brutish necessity wipes its hands upon the napkin of a dirty cause, again a waste of our compassion as with Spain the gorilla wrestles with the superman. I who am poisoned with the blood of both, where shall I turn, divided to the vein? I who have cursed the drunken officer of British rule, how choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? Betray them both or give back what they give? How can I face such slaughter and be cool? How can I turn from Africa and live? There's another poem, um, more or less in the same theme, in which I have tried to use, or I have used, a lot of quotations from literature, a lot of English literature of a particular period. And I've tried to work these phrases into the structure of the poem, modify them so that they are deliberate echoes in the text of the poem, the structure of the poem. Um, to me now, something important has happened outside the poem in that the poem has become dated for people who are ex-colonial. In other words, to me, the poem represents a particular phase of island history. Um, it may be absurd to sound not sentimental, but to sound uh, neither not sentimental nor forgiving about the idea of the British Empire, but now that the empire as such has um, dissolved and it has been replaced by the idea of the Commonwealth. Um, I don't think it's purely a question of sentiment or attachment, but I think that the Commonwealth exists as a very powerful um, connecting thing. I don't want to be known as the Kipling or the Commonwealth or anything like that, but I believe that there is something, purely a question of language and a question of feeling, that joins a lot of English poets together, simply because I think um, English is a language that we work in, work, you know, working in common. Um, this poem just describes the ruins of a house in Jamaica, and it's, uh, it relates to the time of the conquest and the exploitation and so on of the English adventurers. And there are a lot of quotations from, built-in quotations from John Dunn and um, there's one from Blake, and a modified thing from Shelley. The epigraph is from Thomas Brown's own burial. <coughs> Ruins of a great house. Though our longest sun sets at right declensions and makes but winter arches, it cannot be long 
before we lie down in darkness and have our light in ashes. Stones only, the disyecta membra of this great house, whose moth-like girls are mixed with candle dust, remain to file the lizard's dragonish claws. The mouths of those gate cherubs shriek with stain. Axle and coach wheel silted under the muck of cattle droppings. Three crows flap for the trees and settle, creaking the eucalyptus boughs. A smell of dead limes quickens in the nose the leprosy of empire. Farewell, green fields. Farewell, ye happy groves. Marble like Greece, like Faulkner's south in stone, deciduous beauty prospered and is gone. But where the lawn breaks in a rash of trees, a spade below dead leaves will ring the bone of some dead animal or human thing, fallen from evil days, from evil times. It seems that the original crops were limes grown in the silt that clogs the river skirt. The imperious rakes are gone, their bright girls gone, the river flows, obliterating hurt. I climbed a wall with the grill ironwork of exiled craftsmen, protecting that great house from guilt, perhaps, but not from the worm's rent, nor from the padded cavalry of the mouse. And when a wind shook in the limes, I heard what Kipling heard, the death of a great empire, the abuse of ignorance by Bible and by sword. A green lawn, broken by low walls of stone, dipped to the rivulet, and pacing, I thought next of men like Hawkins, Walter Raleigh, Drake, ancestral murderers and poets, more perplexed in memory now by every ulcerous crime. The world's green age, then, was a rotting lime whose stench became the charnel galleon's text. The rot remains with us, the men are gone. But as dead ash is lifted in a wind that fans the blackening ember of the mind, my eyes burned from the ashen prose of done. Ablaze with rage, I thought some slave is rotting in this manorial lake. But still the coal of my compassion thought that Albion too was once a colony like ours, part of the continent, piece of the main. Nook shotten, rook or blown, deranged by foaming channels in the vain expense of bitter faction. All in compassion ends so differently from what the heart arranged, as well as if a manner of thy friend. In the next um, set of poems called Tales of the Islands, I was trying to compress with some of the quality of short fiction um, experiences or portraits recorded as flatly as possible. Um, many, in, you know, in many points, I think the writing, this, although it tries to control itself, takes off into. Um, I have this fault a lot that, um, you know, there's a terrific urge to try and take off and show off and so on. And this happens in, I think, several of the um, poems here. But the whole um, idea of doing this was based, um, as technically, was based on Hemingway's early chapters, those that are used in the early um, edition of In Our Time, in which, uh, this is in a sonnet construction, um, something anti-musical, as flat as possible, could be said, and also to try and compress um, what a short story might have in its quality of plot. There's a very, it's very uh, affectedly titled because I call each sonnet a chapter, but this must be, uh, this was a direct imitation of using the Hemingway thing. Chapter one. The mall white road, the dory rushing cool through gorges of green cedars, like the sound of infant voices from the mission school, like leaves, like dim seas in the mind. You see, Choiseul. The stone cathedral echoes like a well, or as a sunken sea cave carved in sand. 
Touring its Via Dolorosa, I tried to keep that chill flesh from my memory when I found a Santa Teresa in her nest of light. The skirts of fluttered bronze, the uplifted hand, the cherub shaft upraised, parting her breast, teach our philosophy the strength to reach above the navel. Black bodies, wet with light, roll in the spray as I stroll up the beach. Cosimo de Chrétien managed a boarding house. His mama managed him. Number 13, Rue Saint-Louis, it had a court with rails, a parrot, a curio shop where you saw black dolls and an old French barkentine anchored in glass. Upstairs, the family sword, the rusting icon of a withered race, like the first angels, kept its pride of place reminding the bald count to keep his word, never to bring the lineage to disgrace. Devouring time, which blunts the lion's claws, kept Cosimo, count of curios, fairly chaste, for mama's sake, for hair oil and for whist, pairing from balconies for his tragic twist. This is just an old lady I knew. The, this book seems to be full of old ladies. Miss Rossignol lived in the lazaretto for Roman Catholic crones. She had white skin and underneath it fine old fashioned bones. She flew like bats to Vespers every twilight, the living Magdalene of Donatello. And tipsy as a bottle when she stalked on stilted legs to fetch the morning milk in a black shawl harnessed by rusty brooches. My mother warned us how that flesh knew silk Crossing a green estate in gilded coaches, while Miss Rossignol in the cathedral loft sang to her one dead child, a tattered saint whose pride had paupered beauty to this witch who was so fine once, whose hands were so soft. The other poem is an attempt to um, use a dialect in a sonnet um, shape. The content of it is mixed artificial and real in the sense that um, there was, in the island where I'm born, up to when I lived there, which is not, um, well, even as, as, a, as a child, as a young man growing up, there's still a terrific amount of superstition, um, what you would know, what you might call voodoo, but it's obi and stuff like that. And there are points when um, people who tire of the patience and the deliberateness of the Christian religion and get a little tired, decide, well, you know, this has taken a long time, heaven can wait, and they go and find, if, and this includes middle class people and other people, and consult gardeurs, voodoo men, stuff like that. Um, well, in this particular poem, there's a false character invented here who is supposed to be a native a writer was gone away and returned with certain affectation, affectations and you know, uses certain in words and stuff like that. Um, but the bottom part of the poem, towards the end of it, is based on a real um, fact that happened, a uh, terrible thing that happened once in St. Lucia. And this is that um, probably in the 30s or 40s, uh, late 30s, um, two people murdered a child um, to get some money and a boy and this meant that they killed him and while he was still while his body was still warm and um, took his heart out and stuff well this um, you know this is not invented i wouldn't have the imagination to do that <coughs> and this um came out of a one of those wild west indian parties that you get you know these happen um and while the writer is talking his wife, who probably would be English, is being unfaithful somewhere along the beach at a, um, say, a beach club fete. I don't know if this is going to mean anything, but I'm ha I'll have to read it very fast, sort of. Pupada was a fete. I mean, it had free rum, free whiskey, and some fellas beating pan from one of them band in Trinidad. And everywhere you turn was people eating and drinking, and don't name me, but I think they catch his wife with two tests up the beach while he drunk coat and shelly with each generation has its angst, but we has none, and wouldn't let a comma in edgewise, black writer chap, one of them Oxbridge guys. 
and it was round this part once that the heart of a young child was torn from it alive by two practitioners of native art. But that was long before this jump and drive. That went very fast, didn't it? <laughs> Too fast. And here's another um, dealing also with the superstition thing. The character in this one is a merchant who is a lugao, a, wer a werewolf. Now he's, he goes around. This is not a real person either, although it's a mixture of rumor about someone. Um, and he goes around town limping, and people are afraid of him because they believe that um, he was a werewolf and he achieved his success as a merchant because he had made this compact with the devil. A curious tale that threaded through the town through graying women sewing under eaves was how his greed had brought old Lebrun down, greeted by slowly shutting jealousies when he approached them in white linen suit, pink glasses, cock hat, and tap-tapping cane, a dying man licensed to sell sick fruit, ruined by fiends with whom he'd made a bargain. It seems one night these Christian witches said he changed himself to an Alsatian hound, a slavering lycanthrope hot in a scent. But his own watchman dealt the thing a wound which howled and lugged its entrails, trailing wet with blood, back to its doorstep, almost dead. I've tried to do a number of poems in which I've attempted to relate the beat of certain folk um, songs, certain folk shapes in song to language. I don't think they always work because I always come across a difficulty I had of um, either not writing anything purely in dialect and being affected by other, influenced by other um, poems. Um, but I have tried to do um, in this poem, for instance, called Parang, which is a musical folk form, a dance, um, very fast, very formal, the Spanish, a Spanish influence, and this is a Trinidad um, dance. And the person who is speaking here, the character talking, is a second fiddler, in the sense that he is not the, the most successful of the um, musicians. And um, I've thought of him as, while he's playing and performing competently enough as regretting that he has devoted all of his time to, I suppose what the equi equivalent would be, would be to developing his art and self um, life. Parang. This is also in dialect, so God help you. <laughs> Man, I suck me tooth when I hear how them crop time fiddlers lie. And the wailing kiss me ass flutes that bring water to me eye. Oh, when I think how from young I wasted time at the fets, I could bawl in a red-eyed rage for desire turned to regrets, not knowing the truth that I sang at Parang and La Comette. Man, every damn tune, them tune of love that go last forever is the wax and the wane of the moon since Adam catch body fever. I old, so the young crop won't have these claws to reap their waste. But I know do more from don't, since the grave cry out, make haste. This banjo world have one string, and all man does dance to that tune. That love is a place in the bush with music grieving from far. As you look past her shoulder and see, like her one tear afterwards, the falling of a fixed star. Young men does bring love to disgrace with remorseful, regretful words, when flesh upon flesh was the tune since the first cloud raised up to disclose the breast of the naked moon. Um, this is just a, I think, a self-explanatory poem. A lesson for this Sunday. The growing idleness of summer grass with its frail kites of furious butterflies requests the lemonade of simple praise 
in scansion gentler than my hammock swings, and rituals no more upsetting than a black maid shaking linen as she sings the plain notes of some Protestant Hosanna, since I lie idling from the thought in things, or so they should, until I hear the cries of two small children hunting yellow wings who break my Sabbath with the thought of sin. Brother and sister with a common pin frowning like serious lepidopterists. The little surgeon pierces the thin eyes, crouched on plump haunches. As a mantis prays, she shrieks to eviscerate its abdomen. The lesson is the same. The maid removes both prodigies from the interest in science. The girl in lemon frock begins to scream as the maimed teetering thing attempts its flight. She is herself a thing of summery light, frail as a flower in this blue August air, not marked for some late grief that cannot speak. The mind swings inward on itself in fear, swayed towards nausea from each normal sign, heredity of cruelty everywhere, and everywhere the frocks of summer torn, the long look back to see where choice is born as summer grass sways to the site's design. The next poem is um, something I've always, I had always felt like doing. This is just a purely, um, I suppose just a poem of praise, and that's all. Um, just, it's a description of a yacht at harbor on a Sunday morning in the West Indies. A sea shanty. Anguilla, Adina, Antigua, Canel, and Dry, all the L's, YL's of the liquid Antilles. The names tremble like needles of anchored frigates, yachts tranquil as lilies in ports of calm coral, the life ebony hulls of straight stitching schooners, the needles of their masts that thread archipelagos, refracted embroidery in feverish waters of the seafarers' islands. Their shorn, leaning palms, shaft of Odysseus, cyclopic volcanoes, creak their own histories in the peace of green anchorage. Flight and Phyllis return from the Grenadines, names entered this Sabbath in the Port Clark's register, their baptismal names, the sea's liquid letters and their blazing cargoes of charcoal and oranges quiet the fury of their ropes. Daybreak is breaking on the green chrome water. The white herons of yachts are at Sabbath communion. The histories of schooners are murmured in coral, their cargoes of sponges on sand spits of islets. Barks white as white salt of acrid St. Martin, hulls crusted with barnacles, holes foul with great turtles, whose ship boys have seen the blue heave of Leviathan, a seafaring Christian and intrepid people. Now an apprentice washes his cheeks with salt water and sunlight. In the middle of the harbor, a fish breaks the Sabbath with a silvery leap. The scales fall from him in a tinkle of church bells. The town streets are orange with the weak ripened sunlight. Balanced on the bowsprit, a young sailor is playing his grandfather's shanty on a trembling mouth organ. The music curls, dwindling like smoke from blue galleys to dissolve near the mountains. The music uncurls with the soft vowels of inlets, the christening of vessels, the titles of portages the colors of sea grapes, the tartness of sea almonds, the alphabet of church bells, the peace of white horses, the pastures of ports, the litany of islands, the rosary of archipelagos, Anguilla, Antigua, Virgin of Guadeloupe, and stone white Grenada of sunlight and pigeons, the amen of calm waters, the amen of calm waters, the amen of calm waters. Collection will now be received. No calm water.
Um, but these were parts of a first book. Um, I found as a writer I got through, a, I had a very difficult um, time trying to change. Um, I got tired, as pro you probably are, as American writers and people who are interested in of the strict traditional thing. Um, I still, I, I find this, I find that to go back to the, I can't change um, my feel for the more traditional forms, but I, one is always interested in trying to break up things as much as um, he can. Um, the poem that I'm going to read is longish, so, um, you know, but I, I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's, um, if it comes off, but I think it's, for me, it's important in the sense that I was trying to get over something, to cross over a part of um, my work, to get into another side. Um, its title is Origins, and it's very strongly influenced deliberately by choice um, by the work of Pierce and Césaire. Um, to whom I feel a very strong affinity just because um, they are all from the same part of the world. Uh, Pierce is born in Guadeloupe and says there is a Martinican. Um, there are two really great poems from that area and um, they both more or less deal with the same theme. They're interesting to compare in the sense that Pierce is a, is a um, son of a plantocracy, a rich white um, Guadeloupean, and Césaire is the son of a poor black um, Martinican family. Um, this is not, it's only important for the context of the poem because the two poems have the same strength, the same beauty almost, um, and they really are something that, you know, I am very proud of myself because it's amazing to think that um, within such a short distance of each other and within the same time, two great poems like that could have come out. Um, I was also trying in this to lengthen the line um, and to try to compress, to give meaning entirely through the visible, through the image only. Um, again, there are parts where it sort of flops or inflates itself into rhetoric and then I didn't want to have a so the sort of poem in which you have um, cuts, sudden jumps. I try to give some kind of order, uh, rational order to the changes of the images. Um, in other words, I, what I was trying to do, I don't know if this must be very boring, but I was trying to avoid um, the sudden cuts you get, say, in Pound or in some of the modern, other modern American poets, in which the reader is supposed to fill in um, those changes. Uh, also, it is a very ambitious poem in the sense that it tries to um, cohere all the experiences, the cultural and racial experiences of what the West Indian is, which involves um, the exodus from Africa um, and finding a new country and stuff like that. And the epigraph is from Césaire and I just have the English, not the French. And it's narrow path of the surge in the blur of fables. I chose the epigraph because it seemed to me to have this particular um, picture I was after, which is something threading like a current Africa and the New World. Origins. Um, in the poem, sorry, there are a lot of references that you might find uh, obscure. At the beginning there are references to the Caribs, which is a race that was ex entirely exterminated by people who occupied the West Indies, much like the Indians here almost. Um, and then different passages have Try to relate as a boy growing up what, you, what one learns as a um, colonial, the conflict between, or the barely beginning to be realized conflict between um, Greek history, Greek literature, Western literature, and Africa. Um, and in the poem, too, the, the two symbols that are used, I to, sorry, symbols, but they're there. Um, uh, the, the sea is like a civilizing thing, and the river is something more ancestral, something that throws back. So there's a little thing going on between um, the sea and 
the river. The river is African in a sense and the sea is Greek or so on. Origin. The flowering breaker detonates its surf. White bees hiss in the coral skull. Nameless, I came among olives of algae, fetus of plankton, I remember nothing. Clouds, log of colon, I learnt your annals of ocean, of Hector, bridler of horses, Achilles, Aeneas, Ulysses, but of that fine race of people which came off the mainland to greet Cristobal as he rounded Icacos, blank pages turn in the wind. They possessed by Bulbrook no knowledge whatever of metals, not even of gold. They recognized the seasons, the first risings of the Pleiades, by which signs they cultivate, assisted by magic. Primitive minds cannot grasp infinity. Nuage, nuage in lazy volumes rolled, swallowed in the surf of changing cumulus, their skulls of crackling shells crunched underfoot. Now, when the mind would pierce infinity, a gap in history closes like a cloud. Memory in cerecloth uncoils its odor of rivers, of Egypt embalmed in an amber childhood. In my warm malarial bush bath, the wet leaves leached to my flesh. An infant Moses, I dreamed of dying. I saw paradise as columns of lilies and wheat-headed angels. Between the Greek and African pantheon, lost animist, I rechristened trees. Caduceus of Hermes, the constrictor round the mangrove. Dorad, their golden mythological dolphin, leapt flaking light as once for Orion, for the broken archipelago of wave-browed gods. Now the Sibyliana, mother of memory, bears in her black hand a white frangipani with berries of blood. She gibbers with the cries of the Guinean Odyssey. These islands have drifted from anchorage, like gommiers loosened from Guinea, far from the childhood of rivers. O clear brown tongue of the sun-warmed, sun-wooded trumasse of laundresses and old leaves, and winds that buried their old songs in archives of bamboo and wild plantain, their white sails bleached and beaten on dry stone, the handkerchiefs of adieu and babai, O oh, sea, leaving your villages of cracked mud and tin, your chorus of bearded corn in tragic fields, your children like black rocks of petrified beginnings, in whose pot-bellied drought the hookworm boils, cherubim of glaucoma and gonorrhea, white cemeteries of shells beside the sea's cracked cobalt, poinsettia bleeding at your praying stations, shadowy with croton and with glory cedar whose gods of cracked canoes hold the dead hopes of larvae, live middens heaped by the infecting river, fets of a childhood brain sieved with sea noise and river murmur. Ah, mon enfance. Ah, mon enfance. Smothered in the cotton clouds of illness, cocooned in sinuous odors of the censer, buried in bells, bathed in the alcohol of lime and yellow flowers, voyaging like colon and starched linen seas, that watched the river snakes writhe on the ceiling, that knew the forgotten taste of river water, the odor of fresh bread and mother's skin, that knew its own skin slowly, amber, then excrement, then bronze, that fed the Ebo fifes and drums of Christmas, the broken egg in which it sailed at Easter, festivals, processions, voyages of the grave, and the odor of rivers in unopened cupboards. Trace of our exodus across its desert, erased by the salt winds. The snake spirit dies, writhing horizon. Beetles lift the dead elephant into the jaws of the forest. Death of all gods in the ashes of their eyes. The plunging throats of porpoises simulating O sea, the retching hulks of caravels stitching two worlds, like the whir of my mother's machine in the Sabbath bedroom like needles of kikadas 
stitching the afternoon's shroud. Death of old gods in the river snakes dried from the ceiling. Yahweh and Zeus rise from the foam's bed at daybreak. The mind among Sirach seeks its mythopoeic coast, seeks like the polyp to take root in itself. Here in the rattle of receding shoal, among these shallows, I seek my own name and a man. As the crab's claws move backwards through the surf, blind memory grips the putrefying flesh. Was it not then we asked for a new song as Colon's vision gripped the buried branch? For the names of bees in the surf of white frangipani, with hard teeth breaking the bitter almonds of consonants, shaping new labials to the curl of the wave, christening the pomegranate with a careful tongue, pom de citer, bitter citerian apple, and God's eye glazed by an indifferent blue. We have learnt the alphabet of alkali and aloe on seeds of islands dispersed by the winds. We have washed out with salt the sweet faded savour of rivers, and in the honeycombs of skulls the bees built a new song, and we have eaten of their bitter olive. But now, twin souls, spirit of river, spirit of sea, turn from the long interior rivers, their somnolence, brown studies, their long colonial languor, their old Egyptian sickness, their imitation of tea color, their tongues that lick the feet of Buana and Saib, their rage for funeral pyres of children's flesh, their sinuousness that shaped the original snake. The surf has raised that memory from our speech and a single raindrop irrigates the tongue. The sea waits for him like Penelope's spindle, raveling and raveling its foam, whose eyes bring the rain from far countries, the salt rain that hazes horizons and races, who crouched by our beach fires, his face cracked by deserts, remembering monarchs, asks us for water, fetched in the fragment of an earthen cruise, and extinguishes Troy in a hissing of ashes, in a turmoil of cloud. Clouds, vigorous exhalations of wet earth. In men and in beasts, the nostrils exulting in rain scent, uncoiling like mist the wound of the jungle. We praise those whose back on hillsides buckles on the wind to sow the grain of guinea in the mouths of the dead, who hurling their bone needled nets over the cave mouth harvest ancestral voices from its surf, who, lacking knowledge of metals, primarily of gold, still gather the coinage of cowries, simple numismatists, who kneel in the open sarcophagi of cocoa to hallow the excrement of our martyrdom and fear, whose sweat, touching earth, multiplies in crystals of sugar, those who conceive the birth of white cities in a raindrop and the annihilation of races in a prism of the dew. In the last couple of years, I, um, I think one of the most strong, strongest influences I've had um, in feeling is, for some reason, um, Crusoe. Uh, not only not Defoe's book particularly, but I think it's the film of Buñuel that I saw that really, um, you know, began it. And of course, the island of Tobago is. I don't, th I don't think it's the right one. The island of Tobago, near Trinidad, is reputed to be the place where at least the tourist board thinks so. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't want to stretch a point here, but there's, I feel um, as someone in a working, this is very self-pitying and stupid, but I feel as someone working in a outside a tradition, um, and particularly living in a place that's remote, in a sense, from things, I have this, um, you get this, feeling this um, being on the edge of things. The character in this is a combination of um, Crusoe and an, an old man, and not, not the actual Crusoe figure, it's cast away. The starved eye devours the seascape for the morsel of a sail. The horizon threads it infinitely. Action is frenzy. 
I lie sailing the ribbed shadow of a palm, afraid lest my own footprints multiply. Blowing sand, thin as smoke, bored, shifts its dunes. The surf tires of its castles like a child. The salt green vine with yellow trumpet flower, a net inches on nothing. Nothing, the rage with which the sandfly's head is filled. Pleasures of an old man. Morning, contemplative evacuation. Considering the dried leaf, nature's plan. In the sun, the dog's feces crusts, whitens like coral. We end in earth, from earth began, in our own entrails, Genesis. If I listen, I can hear the polyp build, the silence thwanged by two waves of the sea. Cracking a sea louse, I make thunder split. Godlike, annihilating Godhead, art, and self, I abandon dead metaphors, like the almond's leaf-shaped heart, the ripe brain rotting like a golden nut, hatching its babble of sea lice, sand fly, and maggot, that green wine bottle's gospel choked with sand, labeled a wrecked ship, gnarled seaward, clenched and nailed like a man's hand. This is another sea poem. Tarpon. At Cedros, thudding the dead sand in spasms, the tarpon gaped with a gold eye, drowned thickly, thrashing with brute pain this sea I breathe. Stilled, its bulk screwed to the eye's lens, slowly sought design. It dried like silk, leisurely, altered to lead. The belly, leprous, silver, bulged like a coal shanker for the blade. Suddenly it shuddered in immense doubt, but the old jaw, gibbering, divulged nothing but some new filaments of blood. For every bloody stroke with which a frenzied fisherman struck its head, my young son shook his head. Could I have called out not to look simply at the one world we shared? Dead and examined in detail, a tarpon's bulk grows beautiful. Bronze with a brass green mold, the scales age like a corslet of old coins. A net of tarnished silver joins the back's deep sea blue to the tail's wedged tapering Y. Set in a stone triangular skull, ringing with gold, the open eye is simply, tiringly there. A shape so simple, like a cross, a child could draw it in the air. A tarpon scale, its skin's flake, washed at the sea's edge and held against the light looked just like what the grinning fisherman said it would, dense as frost glass but delicate, etched by a diamond it showed a child's drawing of a ship, the sail's twin triangles, a mast. Can all complexities of shape, all terror, bulk and fury fit in a design so innocent that through opaque phantasmal mist, moving but motionlessly, it sails where the imagination sent. Um, I, I have no idea what time it is. I don't know. <laughs> I should, um, I'll just read two or three more. This is just a poem about a trumpeter. Um, old Eddie's face, wrinkled with river lights, looked like a Mississippi man. The eyes derisive and avuncular at once, swiveling, fixed me. They'd seen too many wakes, too many cat house nights. The bony, idle fingers and the valves of his knee cradled horn could tear through Georgia on my mind or Jesus saves with the same fury of indifference if what propelled such frenzy was despair. Now as the eye sealed in the ashen flesh, 
and Eddie, like a deacon at his prayer, rose tilting the bright horn. I saw a flash of gulls and pigeons from the dunes of coal near my grandmother's barracks on the wharves. I saw the sallow faces of those men who sighed as if they spoke into their graves about the Negro in America. That was when the Sunday comics sprawled out on her floor, sent from the States had a particular odor, a smell of money mingled with man's sweat. And yet if Eddie's features held our fate, secure in childhood, I did not know then a Jesus ragtime or gut bucket blues to the bowed heads of lean, compliant men back from the States in their funereal surge, black, rusty Hamburgs and limp waiters' ties, with honey accents and lard colored eyes, was Joshua's ram's horn wailing for the Jews of patient bitterness or bitter siege. Now it was that as Eddie turned his back on our young crowd out fetting, swilling liquor, and blue eyes closed, one foot up, out to sea. His horn aimed at those cities of the Gulf, Mobile and Galveston, and sweetly meted the horn of plenty through a bitter cup in lonely exaltation, blaming me for all whom race and exile have defeated, for my own uncle in America, the living there, I never could look up. Uh, thank you, Reverend.